Hello and welcome to Fishing Documents 101. Go ahead and dive in. Uh, I'm a bit of a command line geek, so you just so you're not wondering that I, that ID commands are just to print my username and groups. So my name is David Forsyth, um, also known as OXDF. Um, I'm a training architect at Hack the Box. Um, I develop machine and challenge content, um, automate things that help keep the platform running smoothly, et cetera. Um, before I, earlier this year, when I, when I started to hack the box, uh, I've worked in InfoSec for the last 15 years in a wide variety of roles. Um, more on the defensive side, but a little bit of red team experience as well. Um, and then worked both in the government and private sector. Um, in addition to that, uh, I am a bit of a CTF addict. I've always enjoyed just trying to learning through technical challenges. Um, and I have a blog um, that I'm the author of, OXDF Hack Stuff. Um, it's a lot of CTF solutions. A lot of it's from Hack the Box, um, but some of it's other CTFs as well. Um, and I'm a little bit of malware analysis and kind of other stuff that gets thrown in. So uh, we're here today to talk about phishing documents. And uh, I, I really love phishing documents. Um, for one, I mean, phishing is one of the most common vectors that are the start to an incident. So it's important and relevant. Um, and phishing documents are constantly evolving. Um, I worked for a short time at a EDR AV company, and we were, of course, trying to look for more generic ways to stop bad uh, techniques from happening. Um, but we also spent a lot of time just looking exactly what the latest attacks were and figuring out how to block and stop them. And so while the you know endpoint AV companies are constantly detecting the latest techniques and trying to evolve, um, the attackers are evolving right back and they're trying to get right past these techniques and updates. Um, and so with phishing documents, the skill set necessary to get started looking at them is actually um, relatively low. Um, you know, with, with malware, when you think of like an executable or a binary, um, you need to understand assembly language. You have to figure out how to open them up in Ida Pro or Ghidra or some other, you know, disassembler or decompiler. Um, and that's before the bad guys are even putting obfuscation and anti-reversing techniques into place. Um, so the, the skill set required to get into that is relatively high. Um, on the other hand, with phishing documents, it's relatively low. If you have some idea of how scripting works, um, some basic technical understanding of computers, and you are willing to Google your way through things, um, you can get started and figure out maldocs. Um, it really comes down to a battle of creativity. Um, the bad guys are constantly coming up with creative ways to try to avoid detection. And uh, the you know defense defense is trying to constantly update to catch that, and so it's not necessarily like a test a technical escalation, but it's a creativity escalation. So probably worth taking a second and defining what do I mean by phishing documents. Um, for the sake of this conversation, I'm going to talk about documents that don't as things that don't typically execute code. Um, so a word document, um, it, it it can technically run macros, and we'll we'll look at macros later in this in this presentation. Um, but you know, when people talk about a Word document, in general, you think about a thing that holds information that's generally kind of static and doesn't run things. Um, so phishing documents, you know, things that get sent through email to try to uh, get execution on some on a computer, um, but that we don't typically think of as executing. Um, so we're not talking about executable files sent in emails. That that definitely happens. It's very common. Um, it's getting blocked more, more and more nowadays, but you know, that still happens. Um, and we're not really talking about like links to fake login pages. Again, that happens very commonly. Um, the attackers will send a link. You click on it. You're you're at the what looks like your company portal, but you log in, and now they've captured your credentials. Um, very valid phishing technique, but that's not really the scope of this presentation. This really all leads to the central question you want to ask when you look at a malicious document. Oh. Scratch that, I'm gonna go back, I skipped a slide. Um, so why are we looking at, uh, why do we wanna look at phishing documents? Um, at the most like tactical level, if, you're, if your company is getting sent a wave of phishing emails right now, um, if you can pull out the IP addresses or domains that they're connecting to, uh, you can put blocks in place at the firewall. Um, that's not a huge scalable thing, it's kind of a game of whack-a-mole, um, but you know, if it's happening to you right now, that's certainly something you can put in place. Um, more, more long-term and strategically, you can start to think about tuning your defensive collection. Um, you, if you look at a maldoc and you see what the bad guys are doing, you can say, hey, would if that had executed on one of the users in my company's machines, would our logs have detected it? Would we have any evidence of that? 
Um, if not, you know, how should we be adjusting our Windows logs? How should we um, turn on new logs? Should we be installing Sysmon and looking for things that we can do additional collection there? Um, and then, you know, once you move beyond that, you can even start to talk about, okay, are there endpoint uh, protections I can put in place? Um, I worked in a Fortune 50 SOC for a while, and we eventually were able to build the case that if we saw a PowerShell process whose parent or grandparent process was any of the office, you know, Word, Excel, et cetera, um, we should use our endpoint agent to just block that process from running at all. And um, believe it or not, there were a few legitimate, you know, business relevant documents that that actually impacted, but we were able to build the case because we had the logging and collection in place and because we understood the threat that that was worth the doing and we were able to put that in place. So this leads you to the number one question you want to really ask when you're looking at a phishing document. And that is, how is this document, this thing that people are thinking is you know, conveying some information but not running anything, how is this document executing code? So I'm going to go through today and kind of the meat of the presentation will be looking at different tools that you can use to do this. And this is by no means a comprehensive list. Um, it's just some of the go-tos that I think are good to know about when you want to get started. And the goal here is not necessarily to make you an expert in any of these, but just you know highlight them, you know show you the capabilities, so that you know if you do go out and start playing with some phishing documents, you're aware. You can say, oh, you know, I, I remember that one. I want to go dig into that further and figure out how to use it. Um, so the tools I'll be talking about today, um, the native viewer, how you can just use those to figure out what's going on, um, zip. Um, the DDA Stevens suite, including, you know, specifically I'll be focusing on OLE dump and a couple of the PDF tools, um, and then a tool called OLE VBA. So when you get start talking about the native viewer, um, this is where the disclaimer has to come in. If you're handling a real malware or potential malware, you want to be really careful. Um, you want to use a VM, a virtual machine. Um, you want to make sure disconnect it from the internet. You might put you know, some logging in place so you can look at the internet calls it's trying to make, um, but you just wanna be careful. You don't wanna accidentally end up infecting you or your company's systems when you're looking at these things. Um, so with that said, a lot of the times, um, fishers are abusing legit features of the programs they're trying, that they're sending to you. Um, so opening it up and looking around can show you a lot about what's going on. Um, so for example, uh, this is an Excel book, and it's the attack here is it's using a technique called DDE um, to download and execute a PowerShell script. Um, and even if you don't had never heard of DDE before, um, you can just look at this uh, expression in A1, and you can start to get an idea of what's going on. Okay, so I don't know what this CMD pipe means, but PowerShell.exe, okay, I know what that, that is, and it's dash W hidden. If I didn't know what that was, I could Google it and find out, okay, that's running in a hidden window. Um, and then there's this long string starting with IEX, and people who've worked on a red team probably recognize very quickly that's often referred to as like a download cradle. Um, but again, let's pretend we don't know that. Um, if you Google IEX, you'll figure out, okay, that's shorthand for invoke expression. It's gonna take some string and run it as if it's PowerShell. Okay, that, that's execution. Um, and I got a new object here. It's a net.web client. I can take a guess that that's going to do something, you know, going out to the internet on a web client. And then download string and a URL. And it's downloading uh, x.ps1 from evilserver.com. Um, so again, I can take an educated guess that this is going to download x.ps1 and it's going to run it. Um, and so right now I've answered my question, you know, how is this thing gaining execution? Well, it's using this weird technique um, and it's doing that. In fact, I've even stepped beyond that and said, okay, what is it doing? And we've got a pretty good idea. Um, another example would be looking at uh, VBA macros. Um, so Office documents have under the hood the capability to do this thing called visual basic for applications. Um, and the idea is, you know, you can automate tasks within your documents. Um, it, I feel like it, it does get legitimately used out in the world. Um, it gets abused a lot as well. Um, so if you're, even if you're not an expert in VBA though, and in my opinion, it's an awful language, no one should be an expert in VBA, um, that's okay. You can still dive in and see what's going on. So if you open up a Word document here and you get this uh, very shady, oh, your edition of Microsoft Word is not good for this. Make sure you click enable, comma, enable editing and enable content. Um, it's a, con a pretty common trick that bad guys just tell you, oh, you know, 
enable that content that I'm sending to you, even though Microsoft's warning you it might be bad, you, you should definitely enable it. Uh, you can trust me on that. Um, so if we open up uh, the Visual Basic for Applications editor, um, it's Alt, Alt F11, or I'm sure there's a way to get to it through the menus in Word. Um, you can see here on the screen, you know, what looks like functions that are being defined and what's going what's going on here. Now it's full of a bunch of junk here. That's not a, you know I don't look at that and go oh I know exactly what it's doing. Um, but at least I've now okay I found macros that are running and that's that's certainly a good start to the first question we're trying to answer, which is how is this document getting execution? Um, and again, this works not just with Office documents, but you know if you poke around in the settings of a PDF document within Adobe, um, there's all sorts of interesting features about you know, I want when this document opens, I want to run some JavaScript code or things like that. And just by looking at the um, using the tools as they were designed, you can un unearth that stuff and get a feel for it. Zip is a handy tool, especially when we're talking about the Office stuff. And to really understand that, um, it's worth taking a second to talk through the different uh, Microsoft Office file formats. Um, I know it's a very exciting topic, but uh, it's worth, worth having a brief overview of. Um, there was basically a big split in Office 2007 that came out with a new version. So in Office 2003 and before, it, documents used this thing called the compound file binary format, CFBF. Um, and that is your typical .doc, .xls, .ppt. Um, and the good news for the bad guys is um, this: all of these things still work in the latest versions of Office. Um, Microsoft is very big on backwards compatibility. And so they don't want to break things and just stop allowing you to open these old ones. Um, and these are the ones that are really commonly used in phishing. Um, that's not to say the other ones aren't, but um, there's some of the protections they put in place make it hard, make them less useful, especially when you're using macros. Um, so what is that? In the 2007 plus versions, uh, there's this format called Office Open XML. And this is your .docx and your .xlsx, et cetera. And then you also have the .docm. And the idea is that Microsoft says, if you're going to run macros, you have to save it as a .docm. And by default, we're going to save it as .docx. And so the, again, the vast majority of the legitimate use cases for documents, people are just going to get used to using .docx. And then when someone really wants to have some sort of fancy automations inside their document, they'll know, if you know enough about Office to add legitimate real macros to it, you'll know enough to also save it as docm and send it to people. And then people can be legitimately skeptical when they see dot docm. Oh, am, you know, I got this document from Bob. Should, would Bob be really trying to put automations in here or not? And that's the basic idea. Um, and that's really useful, except for then a lot of the bad guys, you know, if they just want to put a macro into a Word doc, they just name it dot doc and send it. And then we don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, but anyway, when you do have an Office 2007 Plus document, it's actually just a zip archive, and there's a bunch of XML in it. And almost everything in there um, is in plain text. Um, actually, the macros are one of the few things that are not in plain text. So you can actually just unzip an archive uh, or a document like this and poke around at the XML and get a feel for it. Um, and that's actually really useful both from the, you know, if you're exploring what a document looks like, that's pretty cool. Um, but also, it makes it pretty uh, usable if you have uh, gateway or email uh, filters, a lot of them can unzip documents and then you could you know, write rules that look for certain things inside the XML because it's just there in plain text. Um, so that's going to actually lead me to my first demo of the day. Um, this is a CTF challenge actually that I designed, um, but it's based off of a real world scenario that we experienced when I was working in that um, large company SOC. And we got waves of email, email coming in one day, and they all had PowerPoint presentations that when you opened them and ran them in the slideshow mode, um, the malware, something executed and the malware ran. And so I made, this is, this challenge is based entirely off of that. Um, obviously it doesn't deploy malware, but it has some kind of dummy execution and then there's a flag hidden in it. Um, so let me slip over here into demo mode, okay. Um, Cool. So let's see. So this is the presentation. And again, this was from our uh, cyber apocalypse CTF. It was very, it was all themed on aliens trying to take over the world. So um, we get this awesome document that's marked top secret about how we're going to take back the earth and the weaknesses and the aliens. And who wouldn't want to see that? And of course, it's got the warning down here at the bottom that says, you know, my, 
PowerPoint's probably going to warn you not that this might be dangerous. Just make sure you go ahead and enable it so that you can get access to this top secret information. Uh, and, and that's all good. So we can start to click or even just click around here and we see, oh, like, there's, there's a weird clear box here. And oh, it's hiding some information. And, and a, a lot of times, you know, if you've got experience with PowerPoint, you'll know like there's only one slide here and there's not a lot of information. So they're kind of using animations to make it look like there's a presentation, but there's really not. Um, but you know, there's oh, there's also this kind of weird box here that's taking up the whole thing. Um, and if you click around for a while, one of the things that's neat to look at is under the insert menu under action, um, Microsoft in all of their wisdom um, thought that it'd be a cool feature to give you that um, you can have when somebody mouses over an object, uh, run the pro run a program, an arbitrary program, um, which is, again, I'm not exactly sure why you'd need to do that uh, in real legitimate use, but it's a, certainly a fun thing for bad guys to use. Um, and so we could take this, you know, it's clearly running cmd.exe, and then there's all this kind of obfuscated looking stuff. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into deobfuscating that part right now. Um, if you did, you'd find up it's it's trying to download and execute download a binary from some thing and save it as a, from some website and it's saving it as a specific file name that happens to have a flag in it um, so but again we've answered our question you know how is this document getting execution well it's using the mouse over run program uh, if I wanted to though I could also rather than opening it in PowerPoint that there's the native viewer um, let's not save that um, you know, I could rename this as a .zip or, you know, 7-zip is smart enough to just open it as an archive. And here we go. So now I've got, you know, what is inside of this Word doc. It's a zip with some uh, folders in it. Uh, if I dig in here to the PPT folder, uh, let's see, slides. Here's slide one. If I open that up, I can come down here. And right here, I can even see here's, okay, so I have rectangle 10 here. Uh, it's got a link hover um, ID2 and a PPP uh, PP action program. That's kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, if I go into the rels here and open up this one as well, well, here's here's ID2 again um, on a relationship target with uh, the target gives uh, this long same command line here. And uh, that's referencing back to the ID2, the thing we saw earlier. Um, so you can see the same thing here without opening it up in the native viewer. And again, this is the kind of thing you might be able to automate. If you wanted to look for this technique, you could put an automation at your email gateway that if it was able to unzip a PowerPoint, then it could easily look for these strings. You know, Should I have you know, relationship target or whatever, whatever that might be? Um, so this is kind of cool. And again, we figured out what they're doing. All right, let's look back to the slides here. All right, another set of tools that is absolutely worth knowing about is the DDA Stevens suite. Um, I've never met this guy, but I would love to. He puts up um, all these amazing utilities. Um, his his GitHub has literally hundreds of little utilities that he's written. Um, he's very Windows centric. He does a lot of his work on Windows, but a lot of, a lot of it's in Python scripts you can run. Um, so they run on Windows or Linux. Um, he's also a regular blogger for the uh, SANS Internet Storm Center site where he will do like text and or video walkthroughs of phishing documents and using his tools. Um, it's just incredibly useful. Uh, so two, again, of the many tools he has on his site, um, two that would be really good to be aware of to start with. Um, one is OLE dump. Um, so it does a really good job of pulling apart the different pieces of Word documents, especially when you're dealing, you know, we, we, we just showed how in a newer Office document, we were able to open up the zip and sort of look through it. Um, OLE dump will work on newer ones as well, but it's really, it really earns its money here where if you have the older document formats and you can't just unzip it and open it, um, it's all very binary and complex and proprietary. Um, OLE dump will help you enumerate what the different objects within the documents are. It will help you to um, dump those out, decode them, um, if they're compressed, it can de decompress them. Um, it, it can do all sorts of neat things like that. It's kind of a, um, it's very uh, multi-featured. You can go a lot of different ways with it. Um, it's got quite an extensive amount of options. It takes a little bit of looking at to figure out how to use it, but it's incredibly useful once you once you get playing with it. Um, if you ever get to the point where you have anything suspect PDF files, um, PDF ID and PDF parser are really useful. Um, a PDF file is actually just 
a series of text tags with some binary data smattered in between them. Um, and you have different kinds of tags. So PDF ID will print out all the different tags in a, in a uh, PDF document and show you what they are. And if you notice a tag like auto open or a tag like JS or J JavaScript, um, you can start to say, oh, those are interesting looking tags. Um, and then you can use a script like PDF parser.py, which will um, go through and you can say, okay, I want to, you know, that, that one that was a JavaScript tag is in this document. Go ahead and dump it out. And, um, oh, it's encoded and decompressed, you know, decompress it and decode it for me. So I just get plain text JavaScript. Um, and so that's really useful if you ever have your, your, you know, parsing through these PDF documents. Okay, so uh, the last tool I was gonna go into detail on is a tool called OLE VBA. Uh, it's a part of the OLE tools tool set. Um, it's on GitHub or you can pip install it. Um, and it is really useful for detecting and extracting VBA macro source. Um, so I showed a little bit earlier how you could open it up in Word itself and go into the macro editor and that's great. Um, but this will allow you to, to, well, for one, you can run it from a non Windows machine, which is uh, much more, much safer, I guess. If you're going to try to be, you know, if you're opening up on a Windows machine, you got to be really careful about making sure your document doesn't actually execute and infect your company, as I talked about earlier. Um, if you're in a Linux VM, your odds of doing that are much lower. And again, you can sort of run the, you know, this Python script against it, and it'll still spit out the VBA um, for you. And I'm actually going to show this a little bit later in the, my second demo. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool about it is it'll actually highlight known malicious patterns and like common obfuscation methods. Um, so this picture down here at the bottom, it shows this is what com it dumps all the, the script out. And then at the bottom, it shows you these this table of things. So, hey, there's an auto open keyword um, that's useful to know about. And then, you know, it uses the shell keyword and these other various obfuscations that that's cool. That's again, before you even look at any code, you can say, ah, this, this program has identified these things for me that are important and that I should be paying attention to. Um, and it's a, it's a command line module, so you can run it yourself. Um, it also is a Python module. So if you get into more advanced use cases where <clears throat> you wanted to deploy this in some sort of gateway fashion, where again, your, your email gateway is looking at, you know, running Python scripts across Word docs that come in, um, you could do that and have Python code that handle the results. And again, that's, that's more of an advanced corporate technique, but it's certainly a possibility for you there. So once we, once we answer the question of how is this document executing, um, the next question we're going to want to ask is, well, okay, it's executing. What is it executing? Um, and I'm not going to go into t as much detail here because it kind of goes all over the place. There's, a, there's an infinite number of ways it could go. Um, but I did want to at least bring out, uh, it's very common that what you pull out of there is not just going to be a very clean here. Oh, oh, you found me. Here's, here's exactly what I'm doing. Um, there's going to be some sort of obfuscation involved. And that's both, uh, the bad guys think about it both from a, how do I obfuscate in a way that the um, computers don't detect me? So my, my spam filter um, or, you know, the AV um, on the endpoint, you know, I want to make sure those don't catch it. But I also want to make it so that if a a human opens this up, they don't just look at it and go, oh, I know what it's doing. Um, and so some deobfuscation resources that would be are really useful. Um, for one, the VBA editor I showed earlier. Um, and again, I'll, I'll do this a little bit later, but you know, you can actually open up the document, look at the code itself. And then, you know, one thing that's really common is to put commented lines or just like a bunch of garbage variables in there. You can delete those. Um, or if you think you can find where it's, you know, the shell command is being called, because we saw the OLE VBA called that out for us, um, you can put a breakpoint at that point and run to it. And then you can start printing out what the variables look like and see, and you, you can skip through all the, the or skip through all the obfuscation and just see the results of what's about to be run. Um, if you do end up with JavaScript, um, JS Nice is a really nice um, deobfuscator and beautifier. Um, if you don't like JS Nice, there's a 30 other good ones. If you Google JavaScript deobfuscator, um, you'll find a bunch, but JS Nice is a really good one. Um, <clears throat> CyberChef is a all around, like just good decoder cyber utility knife. Um, 
it, there's there's a version that runs live on GitHub. You put in, you fill in your input, and then you give it. A, you can drag over recipes that you know. So you can say, I want to base sixty four decode this, and then I want to um, hex dump it to see what it looks like. I mean, whatever it is, you drag these different uh, recipes in, and they will perform that. Now on they'll pipeline your data through that, and then give you the output. And it's really useful for trying different things and saying, oh. Maybe it's maybe it's a two byte one byte XOR. Let's try that and see if it works. Oh no, that didn't work. Remove it. It's very neat. Um, there's a couple. There's been a handful of papers over the last few years um, about obfuscating DOS and PowerShell stuff. Um, invoke obfuscation is a very um, popular open source obfuscation thing for PowerShell. Um, and then FireEye came out with uh, invoke DOS DOSfuscation um, a few years ago. Um, and so. A lot of times when you get those things, you know, if you can put an echo command in the right place in DOS stuff, or, um, you know, if you see in PowerShell where it's got IEX, well, that's passing a string to execute it. Well, what if you just replace the IEX with echo? And so now instead of executing the string, it's going to do all the deobfuscation for you, and then it's just going to print it for you. Um, so those are just useful techniques to have. And, and I'll show some of that in the demo as well. So let's say I'm getting you really excited about looking at some documents. Uh, how, wh where do you go from here? Um, you're, gonna need, you're gonna want a place to practice. Um, my my, one of my favorites is uh, Virus Total. And unfortunately it's not free. In fact, it's very expensive. Um, but if you're probably the type of thing where the company you work for has access, not something you're gonna go buy on your own. Um, but if you do happen to have access to Virus Total and specifically the, you know, the paid version, um, you can do searches like the one I have got on the screen here. Um, <clears throat> and what this one's gonna do, for example, is it's gonna say, show me things that are of type doc. And again, you could change this to other types of documents if you wanted to as well, but show me things that are of type doc um, that have three or more uh, antivirus detections and have, but don't have, ten, you know, don't have more than 10. And what well, that's really useful because now you're gonna see, you know, what the latest things that the, you know, let's say Emotet was sending out yesterday. Well, it's actually, well, not Emotet because they've been recently arrested and sent to jail. Um, but, you know, that these prolific groups that are constantly trying to get around antivirus, their latest things they're going to send out and they're probably not going to get caught by too many right away. And so if you, you know, if you're looking over the last couple of days, things that are caught by three or more in less than 10, you're, you're kind of weeding out the, um, good documents, because there's tons of totally benign documents on VirusTotal, um, but you're getting the kind of cutting edge, what are they doing today? Um, you could take that 10 minus off of there. In fact, if you wanted to just you know do like P10 plus and type doc, um, you'll get a ton of stuff and it, almost all of it will be malicious and fun to play with, um, but it's more likely to be the techniques that are a little bit older. Um, so, and again, I, I it's right there on the screen, but you're downloading real potential malware here. So you, this is another place where you just want to be really careful. You want to work in a safe environment. Um, Malwaretrafficanalysis.net is a really cool site um, it's made by this guy, um, Brad, I believe his name is Brad Duncan. Um, and he is just constantly putting out little blog posts about um, things he's seeing in the real world of the latest, a lot of it's like crimeware kind of stuff. Um, the site is a little bit more focused on the packet captures that he that that come along with the malware, um, and he puts those up on the site as well. But a lot of times, and sometimes it's real, it's like binary malware samples. But sometimes he has the phishing attachments and things things like that as well, um, and he usually has it so you can download all of that and play with it yourself. Um, sometimes he even puts out challenges and says, you know, I'll put the answers up in a week, but here take a look at this and see if you can answer it on your own. Um, and so it's it's just a neat place to go play and find things that you can play with. And again, it's pretty. He puts out uh, updates fairly frequently, so you're getting kind of the cutting edge, what's happening in the world kind of stuff. Um, the SANS Internet Storm Center, I'm a huge fan of them. Um, they have a daily podcast that, you know, it's like less than 10 minutes a day, but it's just like a, a really great way to keep up with what's going on in the world of InfoSec. Um, and they also put out a, one to three, what they call diaries a day. Um, and these, again, they're not all phishing doc related, but there's some good phishing doc ones in there and it's worth keeping up with. Um, they talk about, all sorts of interesting things they're doing in the world of internet security and how to keep things safe. So um, it's certainly a cool resource to check out and keep follow. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, you know, being a CTF junkie and now an employee at a CTF company, um, <clears throat> CTFs are a great way to practice. Um, so Hack the Box actually currently has three uh, phishing 
like challenges sitting in the forensics category on our site, um, you could go jump, create a free account right now and go download these and try to solve each of them. Um, I actually wrote all three of these um, years ago though, before I worked for Hack the Box. Um, I won't, they're all, these are all like live on our platform right now and you get points if you solve them. You can see, um, you know, the first one's worth 40 points, et cetera. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about how to solve them because I don't want to spoil the fun for people out there. Um, but, you know, Emo is a real Emotet um, document that is using VBA. Um, Emotet, for those of you who don't know, I mentioned them earlier, but they were an incredibly prolific um, fishing group. Um, did, a lot, did a lot of stuff, often actually would fish and then deploy other people's malware following it, um, but associated with just a lot of really bad stuff. Um, and they recently got arrested, which is great. Um, I guess not for them, but for the rest of us. Um, but anyway, it, you know, I literally took a document of theirs and um, used basically the same obfuscation, but just neutered the payload at the end so that it's not doing anything malicious, but instead it's, you know, making some sort of similar but benign calls um, and then there's a hit flag hidden in it. Um, uh, obfuscation is actually a Frankenstein of a handful of techniques that were going around at the time I wrote it back in 2019. Um, and it's frankly, it's it's probably a few more steps than a real document might have, but each step is something that's real from the wild and it's kind of all combined together. Um, and so, and they all kind of pipe one to another. So you can, it, it, I think it makes a fun challenge. I guess I'm biased, but, um, and then obfuscation too, it's, it's different. It doesn't use macros, but again, it's it, it was a real set of techniques that we were seeing in the SOC I was working at at the time um, that again, take the bad, take the actual bad payloads out and put, put real stuff in and, that's the challenge. Um, so I will give um, one more demo here before we go. Um, this is another real world challenge based off of a real phishing document that uh, we came across. Um, and again, I will try to switch over to the demo machine here. Um, I'm actually gonna start in a Linux machine this time. Um, and let's see, so I'm gonna start with actually running OLE VBA on fishinabarrel.doc. Um, I should say this challenge was called Fish in a Barrel. Um, it ran in a CTF we did a couple years ago. I, I, I wrote this challenge for the site, um, again, this before I worked there. Um, so if we run OLE VBA on this, and I can sort of back up here, you can see at the top here, um, it's actually dumping the macros out within this document. Um, you can see in the, again, you don't have to totally know what's going on here, but there's a class file um, that's got some functions in it. There's there's a function. Here's um, a subroutine auto open. That's certainly interesting, and it's highlighted in yellow because it's bad. In fact, you can see down here also the shell command is red. That's a very suspicious uh, command. It's going to actually shell again. Nobody should be a VBA expert, but if you Google v, you know VBA shell, you'll see it's actually going to take what's in there and run it as a system command. So that's again not to say it's never been used benignly, but it's certainly not something that, you know, it certainly can be abused. Um, and then there's all this other junk in here and we're just gonna skip through that for the moment and go to the bottom. And, you know, again, it's got this table of, okay, this is what what did I see that you should be focused on? Uh, there's base 64 and hex strings. Um, it's trying to hide with the char, the char keyword, um, the shell thing and auto open. Okay, that gives that all gives me a pretty good feel for where I'm going. Um, so what I will often do here is actually just you know run that again and dump it into a file. So you know um, macros.txt, and if I open that up, I can come through here and I can start to look at these. And so I'm, I, I often want to start. I like to just add spaces and things that make it easier to read and try to figure out what I'm doing. Um, I'm certainly interested in this top part where it says auto open. So here's a different function. Um, and what's interesting is you can you see a bunch of things where these fix, C sign, blah, blah, what, what, is, what is going on in this line, right? Um, but if I, if I look at it, you know, if I take a look at this, it's setting this variable ALMKIW. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, so if we search for that, that only shows up once in this whole file. So it's literally setting this variable and then never using it. And if I take a few minutes and look through this, I'll actually notice that all of these lines that say fix and C date, um, are just dummy variables that the bad guys are throwing in here so that you look at it and go, well, I don't know. I could never look at that and understand what's going on. Um, but really, 
almost all of them are irrelevant. And so I can start to remove things and clean up the function. And so the auto op open function really comes down to, it's gonna call the PNTO function with the results of the BH ECP function. And that's, oh, there, there's this function here and there's this function here. Uh, that's okay, I'm starting to understand what's going on. Um, because I don't think it'd be a very interesting presentation for you all to sit here and watch me go through and delete all these things. Uh, I've actually done it ahead of time. So if I go to macros clean, um, you know, I, I've gone through and started to and remove all those lines that were just dummy variables. And, and it, again, it's I, I did it and it took me five minutes to do it. It wasn't um, incredibly time consuming, um, but again, just for the sake of the presentation, um, so cool. So now I have what, okay, so what is this BH thing doing? Well, it's just combining a bunch of strings together and then setting the setting it in VBA. When you have a function, if you set the function name equal to something, that's the return value. It's, 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 a, it's a language. Um, so it's returning all of these combined strings. And if I look, these strings are actually just these function calls down here. They line up nicely. So, okay, so it's building a string and then it is on the, passing that string into this function, which is, what is all this stuff? And again, it actually turns out that a lot of this stuff, like most of this stuff is not actually um, used. It's only, let's see, this is the variable that's passed in. There it is right there. It's actually passing into shell. This is the P character and then the results of the rest of this. Okay, that's, so now I, I've got a feel for how this is working. Um, Let's see. So let's, this is a good point where now that I have a feel for how that else happening, let's switch back over to the Windows VM. Close this out. And again, if you, if, if you're doing this with live malware, this is where I would 100% recommend, you know, turn your, disconnect your VM from the internet so that you can't, that there's no chance it's going to actually make a con connection back to the bad guys. Um, so I open this up and if I come over here, uh, I was particularly interested. Oh, so here's the um, here's all the string building functions. Um, in fact, I, did, I meant to note earlier, but I didn't. You know, you, the first string actually starts with our shell dash e, which is PowerShell encoded command. So run the following base64 encoded string, to decode it, and then run it. Okay. Um, and our shell. Oh, well, we saw that p character gets appended earlier, so that explains where that's missing. Um, cool, so now it's going to run PowerShell. That's pretty neat. Um, but if we come up here to the actual document itself, we find the auto open thing. Uh, we want to go to this line right here that has the shell, and we're going to put a breakpoint. And then we're going to come up to the auto open, and we're going to click in there and hit the run button. And it runs through. It built all the strings. And you can see in here, well, that variable is empty. And that variable is empty. Um, I, I, hope, I hope it comes through in the presentation, but when I hover over these things, it says it actually has the variable name equals empty. Okay. Uh, this is the P key. That variable is empty. Oh, and that variable is set to our shell dash E and then a bunch of stuff that it truncates. Um, very, very cool. I can actually come down here and if I copy that and go to the intermediate window and type print that, I get the whole thing. And so now I can actually copy this out. Um, <clears throat> if I want to dig a little deeper on this, I can say, okay, uh, base 64 encoded string. What do I do with that? This is, this is where, this is where cyber chef shines. So let's see, we'll Google for cyber chef, uh, top link. Um, the other thing that's really cool about cyber chef, um, it, it is a site on the internet, but if you were doing this, um, with, you know, potentially data, you didn't want to show to people on the internet for whatever reason. Um, you can actually download a local copy and it's all just JavaScript in a web page. So you can just run it locally and then there's no risk of, you know, sending this off to a third party site so they can see your data. Um, so I will paste the data in here. You can see right now um, with the input is here, there's no recipes. And so the output is the same. Uh, I'm going to base 64 decode it. So from base 64, just drag that here and you can see it. That, okay. It's starting to look good. Um, now it's actually on Windows with PowerShell. It actually uses 16-bit um, characters instead of the rest. Most of the rest of the world is still using 8-bit characters. Um, but so there's a decode. 
see if I can find it, decode text recipe. And we're going to decode. The encoding is 16-bit LE. And what's cool is, let's say I didn't know a 16-bit LE. I just sort of, you know, it's you can kind of guess. Let's turn that one off for a second. You can kind of guess by the fact that every other character is a dot that, like, something weird, you know, it's treating them. There's something weird where it's, like, double length. Um, but if I didn't know it was, if it was little ending or big ending, I could guess big ending. I'm, okay, that's probably not what I was expecting, but... Let's try little Indian. Ah, cool. Okay, that's what I was expecting. Um, <clears throat> so this is cool. Let's see what do we got here. It's got this stuff at the front here. EMV com spec. Now, what on earth is EMV com spec? Well, well, we can pretty safely check that. Let's just go to PowerShell and let's pay. Let's see if I can copy and paste. Go to PowerShell and paste that in and run it. Ah, it's an environment variable that basically points to cmd.exe. Well, that's kind of cool. Um, but I wasn't expecting C. I, for some reason, I really this. I thought this looked like PowerShell. Well, you know, when it's got these four, fifteen, and five, what what is that? Well, let's again. I could take guesses at that, but I could also just copy it, come over to PowerShell. Ah, look at that. The fourth, fifteenth, and twenty-fifth characters of that CMD path are I, E, and X. So what is that doing? This is building IEX. And we remember from earlier, that's invoke expression. That's run the following thing as PowerShell. Cool. So what's the rest of this? Well, I could go through and try to manually figure that out. But I could also just take the rest of it. And if I don't put an IEX in front of it, and I just paste it here, and I hit Enter, you can see it shows up right here. It just print, you know. So this is the string that would have been passed to IEX had the IEX been there. Um, and so it's similar to what we talked about earlier. It's creating a new object system.net.web client. Um, it's generating, let's see. So this one's generating a random number. Uh, I have a list of URLs that are kind of appended with a amp, uh, an at sign, and then it's split based on that. Um, for whatever reason, that was a really... This document must actually be Emotet as well because that was a just what they always seem to do. Um, then there is it's creating two variables, one, two file paths in the public directory. Um, one they're calling .exe, and the other one they're calling the same the sort of random number .exe and random number .comp. And then it's going to loop over adcx here, and that is our list of URLs. Okay, that's kind of cool. So it's going to loop through those URLs. And for each one, it's going to try to download. So uh, what's YYU? That's the uh, the net client, web, web client object. It's going to use that to download a file from that URL. And it's going to save it as the CDC, SDC. That's the exe. So it's, it's trying to download an exe from that URL. Um, and then it tries to write all of this. If, so if that fails, let's say that URL doesn't exist or it's blocked, it's going to error out right here. It's going to jump down to this catch, and it's going to just loop back around and try the next one. Um, if it successfully downloads the, UR, the exe, it is going to decode these base64 strings, write them into the comp file, um, and eventually down here, invoke item, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run the executable. And then it's going to break, so it's going to stop trying other URLs. That's pretty neat. So, okay, so we, we can expect that this will try to go to these five or six URLs, download an exe, try to write a comp file. If it, if it works, try to write a comp file, and then run it. Um, now, the last thing I'd be interested in is, okay, what's, what's in that comp file? So let's see. And this part, this comp file stuff actually was not part of the real malware. Um, looking for creative places to hide a flag in PowerShell. Uh, this is, I added this part, but um, so we're just going to get rid of this decode text thing. We're just going to base64 decode it. Okay, it's the in, some sort of implant ID. Um, let's see, what is this next one that's writing to the comp file? Uh, interval, 30 seconds. Okay, that's with malware, that's probably telling it, okay, you, you want to call back every, you want to try to connect back every 30 seconds, and it looks like that's configurable. Well, that's kind of neat. Um, and again, I added this comp file. There's no real malware that goes with this one, but uh, this is something we've seen in the real world as well. 
Um, it's not always just like as simple as plain text strings. A lot of times it'll be stored in some binary format, but concepts are there. Um, jitter, you know, you don't want to call back every 30 seconds because then computers will notice that there's a very regular heartbeat. So instead, maybe you add a plus or minus five seconds. Or again, maybe it's instead of 30, maybe it calls back every 15 minutes plus or minus five minutes or, you know, something like that. Um, interestingly, this one's commented out, which again, real bad guys probably wouldn't include that in the file. But when you're writing a CTF challenge that you don't, I didn't want people to just run the binary, see the comp, run this. And then, you know, if they somehow faked the download, then just get the comp file. So I commented this one out, but oh, look, there's there's the flag. We can go, if, we were, if this event was live, we could go get some points for ourselves. Um, and just for the sake of, you know, checking, you can look at the last one and uh, it's, it's URL equal, it doesn't, it, looks incomplete. Oh, URL equals, oh, and then it, it actually, that's right, it writes URL, and then the next thing it does is it appends the file path to it. Um, so anyway, that's not important. What's important here is we took this document, we played with it, we figured out how it was executing, and then we figured out what it was executing. Um, and we could take action based on this. Again, we could do very tactical actions like blocking this list of five URLs um, if we're under attack right now from this document. Um, but we can also start to look for patterns like PowerShell really shouldn't run as a child of Word or um, things like that. that we might want to figure, and again, what does our logging look like that are we detecting this kind of stuff? So um, flip back to the slides here. Cool, so um, that's basically the end of the presentation here. Um, like I said, I do work for Hack the Box. We have, we're really big on training through fun, you know, gamified type things, um, but just cybersecurity training, hands-on experiences. Um, if you're interested in any of that, you know, please reach out to our folks. Um, I know we're, we have people in the sponsors area um, and talk to them. And uh, other than that, that, that's the end of this here. Um, my, I put some contact info on here. Um, my Twitter is OXDF underscore. Uh, I'm very bitter at the person who got OXDF without the underscore, but you know, you can only, there's only so many four letter handles out there. Um, or you can hit me up on Discord. Um, if anyone wants to talk about phishing documents or malware, that kind of stuff. Um, so thank you. <laughs>